Jesus Christ. That's our heart cry this morning. I'd rather have you. All the other things that call out to us came to sidetrack us. I'd rather have you. Thank you, Father God. In the wonderful name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. His name is Jesus. Amen. Give a big hand clap in the house this morning. Amen. 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 I've been looking forward to this Sunday morning. And the guys had a little foretaste yesterday. Yeah, right guys? Yeah. yeah. And it's that guy up there. That's not Craig Rochelle. This looks a bit like him. But, uh, that's right, Rob Mason. <laughs> Mason. That's Rob Mason right there. Move around, greet as many people as you can. You might find Rob Mason in the midst here somewhere this morning. We're all around the place, greet and greet. Please be seated, church. Well, we've got uh, Rob Mason speaking here this morning. Ooh. Spies men heard him yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a great time. We That's had morning great. tea yesterday, guys. And, yeah. And uh, some left over. We'll have to eat it this morning because otherwise the staff will have to eat it tomorrow and that's oh. just not right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's good to have Rob here this morning, and uh, we've been reminiscing a little bit in the last few days, talking about when we first met, and when we first met, I was actually a Baptist pastor, <laughs> Yes, and Rob was a Churches of Christ youth pastor, Yes, <laughs> and uh, I think it was John Bond, was it John Bond that used to pick up all you youth guys, and, and one of them was uh, our youth guy at at my church, Ooh. who ended up being my son-in-law. He's no longer my son-in-law, though. We're still in touch with him, but he's the father of my, my grandsons. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Cam. I remember was, Cam, but you remember John Bond, Cam? I don't know. That, okay, I, I thought remember that John was kind of roping you lot all together. But yeah, maybe, not easy not, to rope no, together. No, yeah. that's right. <laughs> Next time I met Rob, I was a pastor of an independent church, <laughs> which is this one. And uh, he was no longer a Church of Christ pastor. He was a vineyard pastor. Oh. Yeah, no sour grapes. <laughs> <laughs> and the that's next time I met him, I was a Church of Christ pastor. Still the same church. I just, we just changed the label. That's all from Independence Church of Christ. And he had changed his label from vineyard to C3. Oh, no. Same church. And it's, it, we don't really care about the label. No. Nah. Uh, the labels, exactly. label, uh, and then I got to hear Rob's more recent story, and he's going to share some of that with you. And the guys uh, that were in the, the men's ministry yesterday, you, you heard a lot of that story, and uh, it's a serious story, but he made it sound pretty funny, really. <laughs> yes, <laughs> got I mean, in, in, in aeroplane toilets, when you're doing that, talking that stuff, that's that makes oh, you laugh, right? Serious, yeah, it's serious, but <laughs> funny. <laughs> Okay. Huh? And uh, I, I thought, you know, the story that Rob's got, we need to hear. Mm. Not just need to hear the story, but need to hear the application from the story. Mm. Thank you. And so uh, we've got Rob here. We've had him yesterday. We've got him again today. And Thanks, God. If, we, if you're really on it, we can get him again tomorrow, I'm sure. Oh. Oh, no, he's got, <laughs> <laughs> and the next day. Sure and, no, he's, he's got to go and earn a living somewhere <laughs> yes. uh, tomorrow and the next I day. Can. So we're going to make the most of having him this morning. So would you give Rob a big oh. round of Thank applause you. that comes up this morning? Thank you so much. Bless you. That's your lectern guy right there. Bless you, Paul. guy. You even got a spies T-shirt. I'll have to get one of those. That looks really good. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Gordon and uh, Lara. I just love what God is doing in your life. You know, we live in a world of um, light ice cream, light salad dressing, uh, light beer, light mayonnaise, and light commitment. And a lot of people exhibit light commitment in family, in marriage, Lord, the church, but you have a couple full strength commitment to each other, to the Lord, the kingdom of God, to church. Uh, you don't do longevity in marriage and ministry without a few scars, and each of those scars are stories. Uh, but the scars never led to, you know, resentment or we're out of here, this is too much. It's just, um, it just makes you more relatable. And I just want to commend you guys, yeah, for your faithfulness, not just for you as a church, but I think us as a city to have seasoned pastors who've gone, you know, you've probably seen it like myself, you know, all sorts of fads and moves, and, you know, this is the way to do church. Or, no, this is the way to do church. And you, you do your best at times to adapt, but there are certain things you just don't change and you just stay grounded. And at the end of the day, I think that last song said, well, really, it's all about Jesus. You know, really, that's, and really my testimony is all about Jesus. Uh, men, I really, I just bragged about you when I got home. I, I don't know if I mentioned we had a home open yesterday at one o'clock, so I should have been doing housework uh, yesterday morning, but it was great hanging out with you guys. Maybe some of you guys were meant to be doing stuff around the place, but we had a couple of hours together sharing a bit of my story some real practical things, and then the Q&A, I don't think I've been with a group of men where there's been that level of transparency, and that doesn't happen overnight. You have really built a culture where it's very safe to share your stuff, and so I feel very safe here, even though I don't know a lot of you. I sort of remember some of your names like Mark and Graham and others, but I, I just feel this is a, a really safe place, and I think you're all in a good place. But for a lot of people in our city, it's not a safe place. And something happens when we begin to tell our story. So how many of you have ever watched really young children play sport? You know, five, six years old. Yeah. They, yeah. I, my son, when he was about five or six, started Kick, And it, it's just such a great vibe. You, you rock up. The kids, you know, girls and boys, they're short up to their ankles. They're doing all the imitations of their, their favorite player. And then the coach. I mean, so easy to be a coach because there is no position. There is no strategy. Just go out and have fun. Even though initially it was, look, you guys, you're in the back, you're in the middle, you're at the front and we'll, we'll swap. But the moment the whistle goes, these kids, both teams just become one team and they just follow the ball wherever it goes. And they're just, you know, kick it to me, kick it to me. And it's just, it's fun. My first experience of team sport at the age of six on a Saturday morning in Sydney was not fun. It went something like this. My Dad came with me for my first experience at team sport, which is a really big deal because at this stage, Dad had been in ministry for only a year or so, but because of depression, he basically had a breakdown. Um, he got out of ministry, he was medicated, and Mum was the primary breadwinner. So Dad was unemployed to a point he was unemployable. And because of his depression, he wasn't emotionally engaging. And I'm sure to this day, Mum was probably going to take me, and then she said to Dad, Dad, you know, hey, you, take your son to, to, to this soccer game and, you know, be there, cheer him on. And so Dad probably reluctantly was there. But for a little boy, it was like, my dad is about to watch me play my first game of soccer. So as soon as the whistle went, you know, both teams, this groom, and they're following the ball. But already at the age of six, I didn't feel I belonged. I didn't feel... I didn't know the game, and suddenly I felt a little bit exposed. I don't know what I'm doing. And I just watch the, the two teams moving around. I'm just standing sort of near the goalkeeper thinking, please, I don't want the ball to come to me. I don't want the ball to come to me. Guess what happened? The ball came to me. And it was this instinctive thing, this brown leather soccer ball. I can still see it hurtling towards me. And sort of slow motion, all the boys looking to me, 
And then it's just like, whoa, and I kicked it. Oh, I almost pulled my hammy. Uh, I, I kicked the ball. It's getting harder and harder, this illustration. Kicked the ball. Thankfully, I connected, because that would have been embarrassing, kicking, missing. But I kicked the ball out of play. Not a big deal. The boy from this group yelled out, why did you kick the ball out? And in that moment, I can still feel it now. I just wanted to hide and disappear. I can't remember much of the rest of the game apart from I can't wait till that whistle goes. As soon as it was finished, I went up to Dad and we walked home. It's a fairly long walk. And at first, I didn't say anything. And unfortunately, my dad didn't say anything. I was desperate for dad to say something like, hey, that was actually a really good kick. But, you know, dad, I kicked it out. Hey, that's all right. Hey, at the moment, I'm not working. At the end of every day of school, we're going to spend time kicking the ball. We're going to practice. And, you know, he, you know, when we got home, there was no, you know, talking to mum. You should have seen your son. My, there was none of that. It was silence. As I'm walking, I said to Dad, I quit. No, hey, son, 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 please, this is not a good thing. Why don't we do, you know, let's wait for a month before you make this decision. I know what it's like to quit prematurely and to live with nothing, no challenge, silence. So what happens as a child? You begin to join dots. I know why Dad's silence. He's embarrassed because on that day, on that Saturday morning, I felt exposed as incompetent, useless, and I don't belong. And my dad's silence and passivity reinforced this sense of, I didn't just make a mistake. I am a mistake. I didn't fail. I am a failure. I didn't just quit. I am a quitter. Welcome to the spirit of shame. Shame is menacing inferiority. Where you begin to say things like, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not athletic enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not gifted enough. I'm not enough. This sense of inferiority and the greatest fear is being exposed. And so what you do and what silence says to you is, shh, don't say a thing. Remain hidden. Hide yourself. Cover yourself. You see, really, what shame is, shame is a parasite. And it's constantly looking for people whose soul is vulnerable. There's been a trauma. There's been neglect. Something has happened. And shame gets into our soul. And you become the host of shame. Now, for every parasite that has a host, it feeds. What does it feed off? It feeds off secrecy. It feeds off hiddenness. And so there's this inner world, this turmoil of I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I'm unlovable, I'm incompetent, I don't belong, and I am worthless. I am inferior in every way. And so what I believe has happened over the years, this voice, this passenger has been so intoxicating that over time it became a pathway into anxiety and panic disorder. Where in my early 40s in ministry, I had my first public panic attack. And what it led to was for my last 10 years of ministry, I've had therapy for seven of those last 10 years, I've been medicated. I've had panic attacks in the plane. Uh, I've had it in traffic. I've had it while I'm surfing. I've had it in church. I've had it in conferences. I've had it in cafes, restaurants, uh, royal show. And, you know, it, it just goes on and on. Usually where you're in a public place, 
There are times I've woken up in my sleep having a panic attack. It has been all-consuming, and yet I can. it's almost like I can backtrack to one of those points of that vulnerability where the naivety of a child, desperate for approval and love of the father, and it didn't happen, and shame got in. So that's been part of my journey, but what about your journey? What has been the entry point? How, why are you experiencing and wrestling with shame? Because once I, my pathway of shame led me to my mental health issues, then my mental health issues sort of exacerbated the whole shame issue. But for you, maybe, maybe it's bankruptcy, unmanageable debt, the sense of shame. I can't even manage our finances. I've led our family into a really bad financial situation. Anything to do with our sexuality is often an area of vulnerability and shame. It could be sex before marriage, outside of marriage. It could be wrestling with your sexual identity. It could be pornography. And tragically, even with sexual abuse, even though you have been innocent, there can still be a sense of shame. That somehow I've played a part in this and this your world becomes so dark and intoxicating, and it's just, I cannot tell anyone this story. And shame is saying, don't you, just stay quiet. You could be struggling with addictions, gambling and alcohol and pornography and all sorts of things. And again, this sense of my life is out of control. I, and, and it's all consuming. And again, shame is taking its hold. It's just going, yeah, this is good. Moral failure. And, and the list goes on. Can you pinpoint an area where shame has taken, you know, has been a passenger, has been a voice, has been a weight? Can you pinpoint the time, the circumstance where shame has entered in? It's amazing. We go to the Word of God in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, reading from the message. We read the two of them, the man and his wife, were naked but they felt no shame. All we can do is imagine what it's like having no shame. That not only are you naked, you are fully exposed, everything about you. You know, Eve can read Adam, Adam can read Eve, and God can read both of them, and there is no sin, there is no shame. You're not self-conscious, you're not self-absorbed, there is no self-pity. There's never a time where Eve says to Adam, are my thighs getting bigger? There's never a time where Adam's been working out and says to Eve, hey, um, what do you reckon? They're man boobs. Oh, you know, nothing like that. Not, you know, Adam thinking, uh, Eve, it's nearly dinner time. It's, you know, time for you to get in the kitchen. Never a time where Eve's saying to Adam, you've been watching sport all afternoon. Come on, you know, none of that. No fear, no shame, just this innocence. Even though they were naked, it's almost like they were covered with the glory of God. And the whole Garden of Eden was the glory of God. And yet we read there are, there are times in this ancient narrative, the creation narrative, there are times in the cool of the day, it's almost like God will manifest his presence. And it's almost like, let's linger, let's go for a walk, let's just, let's just have some time together and normally you could hear a rustle in the bush oh god is coming he's coming in the cool of the day this expectation but a time occurred in the genesis narrative in the cool of the day god begins to pursue the man and the woman and he asked this question where are you now, God is not, he knows everything about everything. He knows where they are. It's, in a sense, not a question, it's a statement. For them to hear, something has shifted. This isn't like, oh, this is the first game of hide and seek. Okay, ready or not. It's nothing like this. This is devastating. And I don't believe God is saying, where are you? With a, a, a sense of, 
a really angry principal. Where are you? Where are you? Is a voice of the father whose heart is broken. Because the unthinkable has happened. And the man and the woman for the first time are hiding from God because of shame. God isn't asking the question, where are you, to punish them. He's asking the question to pursue them. And here we have the man and the woman, not only naked and ashamed, but a pathetic attempt to cover their shame on their terms and their methodology. You see, God is pursuing them not to say, shame on you. He's pursuing them for him to say, shame off you. Let me take that pathetic covering off and let me cover you with the skin and the clothing of an innocent animal that I had to slay that you may be covered. And this will be a prophetic picture of what I'm going to do with humanity in the future. To this day, God is still asking the question, where are you? Not with vengeance, not with bitter disappointment. Oh, you are such a, di- a disappointment. I hate it when mum and dad said that. I- I'd rather them just yell at me, but you know, to, to be a disappointment. Oh, God would never say that. It's where are you? You keep saying, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not, and he's probably saying, enough of saying enough. Where are you? The way forward, when we're dealing with shame, whatever the cause of that shame is, whenever it happened in your world, it requires two things which stems out of this one thing, vulnerability. Vulnerability is not weakness. Vulnerability takes incredible courage where, first of all, we get rid of the fig leaf. We courageously dismantle all of the props that used to try and cover us and prop us up. All of the things like perfectionism. No, perfectionism is a way of having some sort of control because of all the turmoil and shame in your life. It is so disorderly if I can just have my pantry looking perfect. Can anyone relate to this? There was a time my CD collection was all in alphabetical order. If you went into my wardrobe, short sleeve shirts, long sleeve shirts. No, that's all right. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Red short sleeve shirt with a red coat hanger. Blue. It was my way of trying to numb the pain. But look at the pantry. Look at my filing cabinet. Look at the filing system on my computer. Look at my wardrobe. It's all orderly. And it was the only orderly part of my life. Exactly. Busyness. Is it just me or just about every person you ask, how are you doing? Oh, I'm really busy. Oh, is this like a badge of honor? Like, hey, I'm really busy. In other words, hey, I'm really important. In other words, if I'm not busy, the world's going to, you know, the whole equilibrium of the world is just going to be out. You know, it's just, I, I am busy because I'm really important. Busy doing what? Busy being what? Busyness can be a covering, a way of numbing the pain. Entertainment. I remember growing up, maybe once a fortnight, we could watch Bill Collins' Golden Years of Hollywood on TV, black and white. Some of you, if you're probably 50 and over, you'll remember that. And it was like this treat. We can get to watch a movie. Once a year, we'll get on the train and go to an actual movie theatre. Sound of music, chitty, chitty, bang, bang, nothing but the best. Then I saw Jaws at the age of 15. I was terrified. But but today, Netflix. Guess what did you do on the weekend? 
two seasons of prison break. Ah, oh, I can, <laughs> you're just like, do it all in one weekend, two seasons, it's just incredible. Caffeine, the whole thing, it's just, what, what are we doing? We are overstimulated, over medicated, over gratified, and all of it is covering, covering, covering. So what we need to do in our vulnerability, number one, before the Lord, I am going to strip off the fig leaves. I'm going to get rid of the props. I'm going to get rid of all of this covering. And it's going to take courage, courage, because that covering's been on us for a long, long time. And you, you remove it. Whoa, I feel exposed. It's, you need to feel exposed because in a moment, you're going to put on a covering that just feels amazing. You strip naked the fig leaves, the props, all the things of life to, to numb the pain, and then we courageously cover ourselves with the covering of Christ. It's amazing when you read about history and the crucifixion. It I thought the Romans came up with the, the idea. No, no, no. It's been around for a while. The Romans simply perfected it. Through experimentation, a few tweaks with the design, they, they worked out a way to prolong and intensify the agony. And of course, Jesus wasn't just crucified, he was scourged beforehand. His whole back and front and thighs, buttocks would have been ripped open, all of, many of his internal organs exposed. Then he was nailed to a cross, but the Romans came up with another idea. Let's have the person crucified naked. Let's add to the humiliation of their agony. So here is Jesus, the Son of God, not just experiencing this physical agony. He was naked and yet covered in our sin and our shame. The nakedness was intentional because they wanted the victim to feel shame before they died. Not just physical agony, they want them to be humiliated. And yet we read in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 that Jesus endured the cross scorning its shame. To scorn means to disdain, to belittle. In other words, Jesus through his sacrifice on the cross, not only did he have our sin, he had our shame. And it was like, even though the Romans were saying, we're going to crucify you naked to belittle you, Jesus turned around and said, oh no, I'm going to belittle shame. I'm going to scorn on shame. I'm going to put shame in its place. I'm going to expose shame. I'm going to cause shame to want to run and hide. So we get rid of this outer garment, all of this stuff that we do, all of these props. We get naked before God and then he says, let me cover you with the righteousness of my son Jesus. And it's like I am covered. There is always more grace than there is shame. And so my story now is I am going public about seeing a therapist, being a medicated pastor, struggling with anxiety, struggling with the impact of medication such as low libido and whatever, which my wife didn't really actually mind. That's a whole nother story. But all of <laughs> It's just like, what? great comeback. But the, the, there are filters and I may have, yeah, anyhow. It, like, truly, much of my life, has been an absolute mess, brokenness. Our church was at its very best when I was at my very worst. And I am now going public about this simply because I'm no longer ashamed of my shame. And I know by telling a story, it becomes relatable. And then there are pathways and there are resources and there are practices and things over time that we can do. Because if shame can get on you, I guess it makes sense that shame can get off you. So what I'd like to do, in fact, before I tell close with this story, if you'd like to know more, if you'd like to connect, I've got a website, simply robmason.co. You can become part of the Shame Off You tribe. It doesn't cost anything. All it means is once every two, three weeks, I'll send you an email. There are, are blogs. You can follow me on Instagram. I think it's robmason61. Yes, born in 61. But basically, it's just... 
It's just a sense of connecting. I've had people share their story via email. Here's my story. Uh, there's mentoring available. But the main thing is I want to get this message out. And it's not just, you know, psychology and whatever, because I needed therapy. I needed medication. But the big part of my story is I'm covered. I'm covered with Christ. Now, the medication did its thing, and, you know, all the other things I do, breathing exercises and therapy, it all had its place. But my testimony that is unique from a lot of people is, yeah, but I've got this covering I want to tell you about. It's not Gucci, it's not Prada, it's not Diesel, it's Jesus. Best type of clothing you can get on. It fits perfectly. It's seamless. It just is amazing. So before I hand over to your pastor, I want to take us, I want to do an exercise that I've, I use myself and I use it with other people. And it probably will help in, you know, safe place if you close your eyes. Now, in some sectors, you might call this, we're going to practice visualization. And some of you are, oh, new age, new age. No, no, no. They stole it from us. Remember when God said to Abraham before, you know, he had any kids. And his wife was well past, you know, ability, age to be able to bear children. He said, at night, go outside. Look at the stars. In other words, visualize. Imagine all of those stars are your children, and your grandchildren, your great, great. Isaac, Ruth, Elijah, Joshua, and who knows? Just a simple exercise of using his imagination and then it's almost like the future became a present reality. So I'm just going to take us on a, a little journey. So just close your eyes simply not to be more spiritual but just so we're not distracted. And so I want you to imagine that shame is a person. He's been a passenger in your life. He's been a inner critic of your life. He's been nagging. He's been belittling. And you give shame the shock of its life. You say, hey, shame, I'd like you to come with me on, on, a, on an adventure. And shame says, what? Just the two of us? Yes, just the two of us. And so you, you make your way to this jetty and there's this boat and say, okay, shame, get on, get on the boat. It's just the two of us. We're going to go to an island. So shame gets on the boat with you and you start going out. And after about half an hour, shame says, are we there yet? You give it the silent treatment. And then an hour, two hours pass. Are, are we there yet? No, oh, it won't be, won't be far. And you're going and going and a few hours have passed. And eventually you say to Shane, hey, look, look, there's an island. It's a oh, whoa, it's a tropical island. And anyhow, you, you make your way up to the island. You get out of the boat. You're walking on the sand and you say to Shane, hey, Shane, would you like to start our adventure with a game? Shame says, oh, I love games. So yeah, I, I know you do. You've been playing a game with me all my life. But anyhow, you say to Shame, Look, we're going to play a game called hide and seek. Oh, I love hide and seek. It's like, yeah, I know you do. You're really into hiding, aren't you? Yes. So anyhow, you say to Shame, I want you to close your eyes and count to 50. And then you simply say, ready or not, here I come. And then you're to look for me. Oh, okay. I, I, I reckon I'll be really good at this. I'm sure you will. So you say to Shame, Close your eyes and count to 50. Okay. One, two, three, four. And Shane's starting to count to 50. And you quietly get into the boat. You push it out. And you get the oars out. And you paddle out. And after a, a little while, you turn on the little motor. And you start leaving the island. And you can hear in the background, 35, 36, 37, and it's like you can hear this distant voice, shame is still counting, then you hear him go, 48, 49, 50, ready or not, here I come. And you can just hear him very faintly, and then you start hearing him after a few minutes, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Just faintly in the distance. One hour, two hours, three hours. Absolute silence. You can't see the island anymore. And the first time in a long time, 
that inner critic, that passenger is gone. And you are free. Shame off you. Too often we've said or heard, shame on you. Mm. And this morning we're declaring shame off you. Yeah. Would you stand with me, please, church? Uh, this morning we're going to sing a song. Uh, it's called Thank You because we've got so much to thank mm. God about this morning. And maybe, just maybe, you've been dealing with some of these issues in your own life and this morning you need ministry, you need prayer. Mm. Uh, during the singing of this song, I'm going to invite you to come and stand up here if you need ministry, yeah. you need prayer because... You've been dealing with issues of shame and other issues that are associated with that. Maybe, just maybe, this morning you've heard for the very first time that you can be covered with the covering that God wants to cover you with rather yes. than the covering of shame. Yes. And you want to begin a brand new life, a brand new journey Very with good. Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Come and stand with the people who are going to stand here this morning. Mm. I want to pray for you in Jesus' name. As we sing this song, by the way, by the way, You'll note that God pushes through walls. Jesus Christ pushes through walls and deals with your shame. Would you sing that loudly and proudly this morning? Make your way out here if that's you, as the Holy Spirit nudges you. Let's sing together.
you go and get yourself a cappuccino. If you met someone new here this morning, you go and buy them a cappuccino, right? Take them in and show them where it all is and check it all out and hang around for a while and chat to Rob if you want to do that. And, and I would encourage you to come back tonight. We're in a series of messages Sunday night, six o'clock, by the way, we do communion Sunday nights and, and uh, we, we look to a healing thread on Sunday night. So you want to come back tonight and be part of uh, our message tonight. God's doing some new things. By the way, last week we looked at where there are no oxen, the stool is clean. But strength comes from the oxen. We've got a similar one tonight and that's kind of that that kind of thing. Be blessed people, have a fantastic day, hang around for a while, have some coffee, have uh, raisin toast and some other goodies that we've got here. Tap to Rob and be blessed.